Hello, everybody. Welcome to the ISA former president's special session. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, past ISA presidents. The theme today uh, is on the theme of the Congress, power, violence, and justice, reflections, responses, and responsibilities. Uh, I'm just going to introduce, uh, say a line about the land acknowledgement, as you know, uh, as noted in, the more uh, in more detail in the opening ceremony, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the indigenous, indigenous peoples of this region. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start uh, today's panel uh, with uh, first uh, Margaret Archer. Margaret Archer was from the University of Warwick, United Kingdom. The title of her presentation is The Iron Bars Get Closer, a, norm a, a, a Normative Regulatory Coercion. Thank you. Each one will get the time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Ah. Okay, is that, is that working? Good. Well. Sorry. Uh, Thank you for inviting the past presidents um, in the conviction that we still have something to say, which we hope we do. Uh, if any of you are um, uh, slightly wondering what the conditions are for being a female president of this um, august body, they're very simple, they're just two. Uh, you have to work very hard, but much more importantly, you have to be called Maggie. <laughs> if not, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have a picture of that. We'll have a picture of that. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk on the Congress theme, uh, but I'm taking a rather um, unusual. Uh, perspective on it, angle on it. Uh, I'm going to talk about a kind of coercion. You could call it violence if you wish to, but it's about the decline of normativity as the root of social control. Now, this was the case in legal theory under Hans Kelsen, who believed mm, until the end of his life, then he had some doubts, but believed for most of his life that there was one ground norm. And from this ground norm, all the rest of valid law descended like a cascade. Uh, and this is very much the same view that Parsons echoed in social theory with his central value system. So in both cases, the validity of the law was traced back in what I call a morphostatic story. Uh, that is, it was based upon the idea that norms were durable that you could talk about uh, the normativity of a particular country or region. This became very dubious, of course, historically, when you had events like the French Revolution, followed very quickly uh, by the transformation of the revolutionary law into imperial law under Napoleon, we'll skip the consulate, uh, and that created quite a difficulty for other nations. It exercised them considerably because if norms were in some way integral to a society, a civilization, etc., then which of these two new forms of legal prohibition, regulation in France was the genuine one? If you said, well, let's go for the older one, that was the French revolutionary law, but 
That, of course, is preceded by the Ancien Regime and a very different kind of law. If you went for the newest one, which just happened to be actual at that time, uh, you were actually saying that you had rejected, forgotten about this historical link that was supposed to be perpetual. Now, of course, as time has gone on, and we only have a quarter of an hour each, um, morphogenesis, this is my own approach based in critical realism, morpho deriving from shape, genesis, as you all know, uh, this has become more and more intense. It has speeded up, but speed is not the crucial thing about it. That's what accel where acceleration theory goes wrong. Uh, but morphogenesis did pose real problems for the law, its validity, its binding power, its regulatory role. It's intensified over the last three or four decades. I date it it's a very approximate dating from 1980 when morphogenesis really did take off as multinational capitalism and financialized capitalism got together with digitalization and produced some of the financial horrors that we know ensued from that, ending with austerity and um, more problems for nation states to deal with. The basic problem that morphogenesis poses for social control is that a social change increases. Those of you who are older, do you remember the days when we used to take as undergraduates uh, two courses? One was called social change and the other was called social control. Well, these are gone, but the problems that they uh, indicated certainly haven't disappeared. And morphogenesis has created a novel problem for legislative regulation. Um, namely, how can law keep up with social change? because increasingly law lags behind novel, innovative malfaisance, new forms of crime, because morphogenesis has the inherent tendency for variety to stimulate more variety in crime as in other fields. So as this process engages, uh, it outdistances the chance of law ever catching up in late modernity. It can't catch up. I could give you all the statistics for different countries over that 30, 40 euro period, 4,000 new uh, crimes were put on the statute books in Britain. And law could not cope with this. The House of Commons actually passed a bill saying that there would be no more crimes added to the list. It's one way of dealing with crime. Um, so what happened? Because we need legal regulation. I understand legal regulation as the use of a certain kind of power that's utilized for the purpose of gaining advantages over others, including self-protection, and punishing non-compliance in order to impose one's own will as the government on the wills of other agents. So the main reference are twofold. Firstly, it accentuates the techniques that coercing agents can employ to get other agents to do or to refrain from doing certain things that are 
considered to be against governmental interests. And secondly, it focuses on the kinds of reasons why coerced agents do or resist doing something that the powers that be want them to do. So I'm using a kind of stipulative definition which focuses on the law being overtaken excuse me, by bureaucratic regulation at the end of the 20th century and trying to explain the conditions and the consequences of regulatory statutes replacing law. Uh, to some extent, this is built thank you, uh, upon Robert Nozick's account, which recommends itself because it's based upon the concerns of the agents in question. And any of you who know my work on morphogenesis or on being human or on reflexivity will know that human agential concerns are absolutely central to it. Uh, that doesn't at all make it individualist or methodologically individualist because these can be the concerns of groups, collectivities, things like unions, things like voluntary associations, things like political parties. Um, and therefore, uh, it's not reductionist. But it does always ask the question, how much does it matter to X, whether X is an individual or a group, uh, to prevent Y from doing a particular action? And how much does it matter to Y to carry out that action in question? In other words, how far is it a burning concern, one of their prime concerns, um, that this should be realized and embodied in the process of governance. Now I'm going to have to skip over uh, a whole review of command and control and um, the hollowing out of the state and the development of hybridity between the state and regulatory bodies. Uh, that's a whole um, hour's lecture in itself and we haven't got an hour. So instead I developed um, a very simple um, ideal type, if you like, of what a regulation, what its main properties were. So my argument is that regulations exert a causal force, not a moral force. They are non-normative. Uh, they are unrelated to the approval of those to whom they apply, whose agreement, democratic agreement, is very, very rarely sought after. Secondly, regulations don't attempt to make any or to meet any form of normative requirement, whether it's legal based on law, convention, or personal uh, reflexivity. Regulations instead depend upon things like fines and penalizations, which are punitive, but without, and this is what crucially distinguishes them from, from law, without entailing a criminal record or acquiring any social sanction for what you do. Yes, people may yell at you and curse at you, but it doesn't get any worse than that. This is because they work through instrumental rationality of the subjects in question. The subjects in question feel no obligation to abide by these regulations. They are simply calculative or prudent uh, in their responses. So if you 
drive up to a station wishing to park your car and it says no parking outside the double yellow lines or whatever they use. Uh, penalty for this offence, 75 pounds, dollars or whatever. It's down to the individual as an instrumental rationalist to exercise cost-benefit analysis or whatever they think of it as being uh, to say and answer the question, which is a reflexive question, is it worth it to me to pay $75, pounds, whatever, uh, to park for the day? And if they can afford it, their answer may well be yes, in which case they go ahead and they park in what old-fashioned terms would be called illegally. Now we have to call it irregularly. And yes, they may well get caught, they may well get a ticket, they may well have to pay $75. But it's worth it to them, so they do it. Now, that is very important, because in law, the question was always different. The question was, can I get away with it? Can I rob this bank, this jewelry shop? without prosecution, detection, investigation, etc. Uh, this is done in the open air. Yeah, I know I've broken the regulations, but I'm ready to pay, so, so what? Finally, regulations have to be actual. It would sound very odd indeed to talk about the dead letter of the regulation. Once regulations are abolished, they're just gone forever. Unlike laws, which can retain some kind of normative grip on those who were brought up with them. And the advantage of these regulations is that they can be displaced and replaced overnight without any appeal to their democratic validity. In other words, without consulting the populace in question. And that's a big part of their attraction. And it's attractive, not just to governments, uh, but to all sorts of collective agents, from retailers, uh, con conditions for return, reimbursement, um, etc., public utilities, landlords, no pets, hotels, um, you know, no children, unaccompanied children, financial services, libraries, taxi drivers, etc. Now, the law as it exists may or may not uphold one of these or any of these. There was a wonderful case uh, in England of a family bakery, and they were approached by a gay couple who were about to get married and the gay couple wanted two male figures standing on the top of the cake. And the bakers were evangelicals of one kind or another. And they said, no, we, do, we disapprove of gay people. Um, and that was taken to court by the two gay men. And the court overruled the bakers. The bakers just had two choices either put those two guys on the top of the wedding cake or face the protest that might accumulate outside the shop from the LBJ, etc. community. Uh, so regulations don't depend upon existing conventions. Often their aim is, is quite the opposite. It's to uh, police vocabulary um, and behavior, so we get political correctitude, and convention is now more frequently, oddly enough, remade by regulation rather than vice versa. So take swearing. There's nothing illegal about swearing. Many people do swear, but we are all, as publics, warned for example, on aircraft, do not 
assault and insult the cabin crew by swearing at them. Uh, in other words, the fact that there is this convention of not swearing at um, such public servants uh, diminishes the amount of swearing in society. Now, I haven't checked this out empirically, but I'm sure it could be demonstrated given uh, enough grants and um, students. Um, finally, regulations are ultimately intrusive of previously unregulated uh, areas of life, and often they are regarded as completely idiotic by the population that they're imposed on. So the EU Commission Regulation 730-1999 says carrots on sale in supermarkets uh, should be straight, they should have no secondary roots, and they are not proper carrots um, if uh, they don't abide by this convention. So we have the question, why did this regulation increase? Firstly, I argue, but I won't have time to go into it, um, it's when politics shifted from being right versus left, when it shifted towards tactical governance, or centrist politics, as I call them, preoccupied by tactics, with a Saint-Simonian preoccupation with the administration of things rather than the government of people, reliant neither on consensus or consultation, and thus recommending themselves as ready responses to novel changes. And this political correctness induces a wedge between social policy and normativity. So long as a veneer of civility is maintained, so long as people don't call one another uh, slags, um, packies, um, plebs, then nobody is interested in the genuine ontological differences between ethnic groups, gender groups, or class groups. It's just let's keep things quiet on the exterior and all will be well. Now I can go on about some of the things they use, such as performance indicators, but you are all familiar with those uh, because universities are one of the main targets for uh, a normative regulation. What matters is student satisfaction, impact factors, uh, and things that are wholly unrealistic. Okay, so to summarize, a normative social regulation can respond faster to novel social changes, but only by severing the link to traditional legal concerns about legitimacy. They don't have to be legitimate, yet they are not concerned either with social matters about legitimation. They are just like neutral tools in a toolkit, which at the moment happens to be particularly convenient to the powers that be, at least in the Western world, but more than likely going beyond it because it creates fake beneficiaries in the form of adverts that you've all seen on Google. Singapore has the greatest STEM research uh, record in the Asian world. And Singapore is meant to be proud of that and students are meant to be guided by that. So that is why it is coercive, because it has severed its links with ontological reality, 
And yet, it does not bind people, it does not bond people, it simply coerces them into behaving one way rather than another. Sorry that was so rushed. Question answer, so Thank you so much, Margaret. We're going to have a question and answer period at the end, and so perhaps at that point we can elaborate. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Michael Burawai uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and Michael's uh, title is Power, Violence, and Justice, Re-Envisioning the Great Transformation. So let's welcome Michael Burawai. I've got 10 points, 15 minutes, one and a half minutes each. <laughs> First point, it's great to be a past president. <laughs> I feel very past indeed, but it's not all bad. In fact, it's all good. I feel totally liberated. I can wander around the corridors, talk to people, smile at people, joke with people, attend sessions, and people seem to be happy to see me, or some people, they're not very skeptical, cynical, questioning what terrorist activities I might have up my sleeve. I am powerless. So thank you for inviting me here, and I'm very happy to be a past president. That was my first point. <laughs> Second, thinking back to when I was president in Yokohama and the four years from 2010 to 2014, those were years of optimism. I remember giving so many talks about Arab Spring, about indignados, uh, about Occupy movement, Taksim Square, all those squares. And then we are here. 2014 to 2018, and I heard President Abraham give this very gloomy speech on Sunday that here we now talk about illiberal democracy in Poland and in Hungary, we hear about Turkey, we hear about the dissolution of the Arab Spring that I think was already present in 2014. We hear from time to time about a fellow called DT, Trump, and the Trumpism that has invaded the world. So a swing from optimism to pessimism. But look, if four years ago we we're optimistic and now we're pessimistic, Surely in four years' time, we'll be optimistic again. <laughs> we have to be careful not to think that what exists will always be. We need to understand the field as sociologists in which these political movements engage. And I'm as guilty as, as others. We have to use the idea that actually in 2014 there was already, and I did indicate it on one of my slides, a sort of clouds are on the, up on the horizon of what was happening. We cannot actually dissociate movements of the left and of the right, of freedom and of authoritarianism. They have to be seen in connection with one another. As sociologists, we have to look at the whole field. It's like watching... I don't know, watching the final of the World Cup and you only see the Croats, Croatians. Very tough, strong, powerful team. And you would think they're winning, but actually because you only see one team, you don't see the brilliance of the French. You cannot watch a football game without seeing both sides. The yellow cards, the red cards, the extra time. You have to see the whole field of social movements. And so I think we have to sort of recognize that actually with right there is also left, with authoritarianism there are movements to freedom. And talking to people in this Congress, I've been very encouraged as well as depressed about the conditions in different countries. And as sociologists, I think we tend to be easily depressed 
and easily optimistic. Mm. So we need to see both sides. We need to see also the forces at work. And for that, I believe we need social theory. We need a way of thinking about the relations of different movements, different forces. And so, if my second point was all about social movements then and now and how we should look at the field of movements, of politics, my third is, very simply, theory without sociology is empty. There were times when sociology was all theory. In fact, Margaret actually referred to the Parsonsian world. Very theory, but that is theory without sociology is empty, but sociology without theory is blind. So I want to insist on the centrality and importance of theory, which is my third point. And my fourth point is where is that theory to come from? It doesn't spring from nowhere. And nor does it spring simply from the data. We're obsessed increasingly with big data. But big data of itself will not offer us theory. Or if we think it does, it is because we already bring to that theory a whole set of presuppositions, a whole body of latent theory that has to be itself interrogated. We need to actually begin with social theory. So my fourth point then is, yes, we need to begin with social theory, and I'm going to illustrate the beginning with social theory with a fellow that I keep on coming back to every few years, a fellow called Karl Polanyi, who wrote a book called The Great Transformation. You may or may not recall that he was one of my three Ps. I had, four years ago, three Ps. Piketty, the Pope, and Karl Polanyi. And Karl Polanyi won the Battle of Theory. Well, I sure, made sure he would. Anyway, why Polanyi? Why Polanyi today? We could have had other theories too, but why Polanyi today? Because Karl Polanyi claimed that if you push markets too far, then there will be a reaction, and that reaction can take different forms, some of those forms more problematic than others. He saw the reactions to the advance of the market in the 1930s as being, on the one hand, the New Deal, social democracy, Stalinism, but also fascism, for which he was particularly concerned. So it was a recognition that actually pushing markets too far leads to a reaction, leads to a really problematic political regimes. And Although he did not talk about the relationship among these regimes, the recognition that actually pushing the market too far, which we call today neoliberalism, I call third wave marketization, it's not the first time we've had this, is actually going to lead to different responses. And we see those responses all over the globe. That was my fifth point. My sixth point, and now I am coming President Abraham, to your power, violence, and justice. I follow orders. Perhaps it's regulation. Yes. Right. Power. Power. Sixth point. Look, Polanyi did not anticipate that ever again humanity would make the mistake of moving towards neoliberalism, moving towards a second for him, market fundamentalism. He could not think that humanity would make such a mistake. Why did he not think that? Because the sources of market fundamentalism were of an ideological character. And others have argued that neoliberalism had an ideological source. The Mont Pelerin Society, the Hayaks of this world. But I would claim that actually market fundamentalism is a product of the dynamics of capitalism, a category that he did not thematize. So I think we have to see that the crises of capitalism are ever continuing and lead to one solution is market fundamentalism. It is an attribute of the dynamics of capitalism. Which brings me to my seventh point. 
to do with Karl Polanyi's idea that actually market fundamentalism has to be seen through the lens of what he calls fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money. If they are commodified, they destroy their use value. And it is that destruction of their use value that actually leads, he argues, to social movements. But what he does not pay enough attention to is that the constitution of these commodities, of turning labor into a commodity, labor power, land into a commodity, nature into a commodity, and money into a commodity, actually involves disembedding these entities from social relations, it involves violence. And he downplayed the violence even of the Enclosure Acts when he talks about Britain. So I think also it's not a, just a matter, it's not a, 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 a one, a genesis, genesis of commodification, the origins of capitalism, but actually as David Harvey has argued and others have argued that this process of commodification involving dispossession about which we have heard a great deal is actually an ongoing process. So violence becomes an integral aspect of contemporary capitalism in the form of dispossession. That was my seventh point. Turning to my eighth point, justice. There's a tension in Polanyi's work, two-dimensional approach to justice. On the one hand, what we've heard a great deal about is how social movements generate the commodifi uh, how, sorry, how, how commodification generates a reaction, a reaction to the commodification of these fictitious commodities, which in turn generate social movements that he puts under the umbrella of the protection of society. And I have spoken a lot about this in the past, the idea that actually we should focus not so much on exploitation, but much more on commodification as something that people experience and as the basis of social movements. But once we recognize that, we notice there's a left and a right, a authoritarian response perhaps, and a more expansive response and what I would like to suggest that the notion of justice cannot be just applied to those we are sympathetic to that we have to recognize that the supporters of Trump themselves are pursuing a notion of justice they have their own notion of justice their own rationality so yes yeah, so justice is not something always that we are uh, empathize and sympathize with. It may be a pursuit of something to which we are opposed. And the, that was my eighth point. So on the one hand, as I've been saying, commodification leads to a so-called counter movement, but there is a second tension in Polanyi, which is my ninth point, justice number two. It is a tension that he explores that is particularly relevant to the 20th century rather than the 19th century, it is the tension between capitalism and democracy. That liberal democracy in itself generates struggles that challenge capitalism. This is an old idea that Marx first expounded in his famous book, Class Struggles in France, written in 1851. That that's tension between capitalist and democracy, according to Polanyi, can be resolved in two ways. Either the development of deeper democracy, socialism, which would involve the transformation of capitalism, or it involves the development of fascism. And it is this tension between fascism and socialism that also we can see today in the social movements. So 
I want to draw attention, therefore, on the one hand to the idea of the expansion of the market leading to counter-movements, and on the other hand, the idea that capitalism and democracy are ultimately at odds. That if there was a 50-year blip when it seems that capitalism and democracy were able to live together. But that is over because capitalism is no longer in a phase of granting concessions to dominated classes that is the foundation, as Adam Shavorsky has argued, in the foundation of liberal democracy. So I think that that is a very important idea to build on, and we see in the social movements of today how they, whether they have left or have right, circumvent, circumvent liberal democracy. And I've only got two minutes left, and I'm at number 10. So what is my last point? I think it is important for us to recognize that the world is not a world we particularly like, and I have heard so many very sad stories here and elsewhere about shifts in the climate, political climate, in so many places, and we all know that. Moral imperative is important. But it's not enough. We are sociologists. And it seems to me that we have to begin to understand what are the possibilities and what are the openings in the world today. And I think we have to therefore, in a sense, be sociologists to do what Gramsci says, the world appears to be natural and necessary, but our task is to show that it is not natural and necessary. Or to be C. Wright Mills, to link the micro and the macro, the private troubles and public issues. Or to be Karl Marx, men and women make history but not under conditions of their choosing. But we cannot think about this unless we think about the conditions of our own existence as sociologists within institutions of higher education. And I think we have to extend Polanyi's three fictitious commodities to a fourth, which is the commodification of knowledge. And to some extent, this is what Margaret was talking about in the development of an audit culture in universities. This is, in my view, in my view, part and parcel of the transformation of the university. A transformation from the university being in a capitalist society with some autonomy which went along with the ideas of liberal democracy, from university and capitalist society to a capitalist university, in which the very principles of the university become shift slowly from the pursuit of knowledge, dissemination of knowledge, teaching as ends in themselves, to the university as a center of profit-making of revenue generation and the application of regulation. So I think if we are going to engage the world, to use a phrase, of public sociology, as public sociologists, we have to be ever more recognize, ever more recognize the world in which we come, ever more recognize the conditions of the university and the spaces within the university, and also to defend that university. And to defend that university is going to mean moving out of the university and not being constituting ourselves as we once were ivory towers. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker. Uh, is, is Alberto Martinelli from the University of Milan, uh, Italy, and the, the title of his paper is The Rise of National Populism in Western Democracies. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. Uh, actually, it is uh, in Western democracies, but more specifically in uh, the member states of the European Union, since uh, national populism is a phenomenon which takes very different forms in different epochs, different regions of the world, so it's absolutely necessary to contextualize. Um, I will start with populism. Um,
Populism is an ideology, is a political strategy for getting to power and uh, keeping, staying in power. And um, as we know, some think that um, is not an ideology, it's just a rhetoric. Actually, it is an ideology. It is an ideology rather simple, with a rather simple core, thin, but strong, which is based uh, on some basic tenets. The fact that uh, it's organized around two concepts of people as the legitimate source of power and community as the legitimate criterion for defining the people. It is based on the antagonistic relationship between two homogeneous groups. We, the people, the pure, virtuous people, as an undifferentiated whole, which is a kind of non-sociological concept, because we know that actually we are looking for the different uh, actors, layers of different societies. They are, it is an undifferentiated whole. And uh, them usually of two kinds, inefficient, selfish, corrupt elites of various kinds, economic, financial, political, bureaucratic, intellectual, and minorities, marginal groups, which are not considered part of the people. It can refer to different type of uh, people, of the notion of people. The demos, legitimate foundation of the political order, or the people mass against uh, the exploiting rich, or the people nation with its ethnic roots. That's the type of populism I'm interested in. Because the vagueness and plasticity of the ideological, ideological core of populism thin and strong at the same time, allows the populist rhetoric and ideology to be combined with a variety of thicker ideologies, such as nationalism or leftist radicalism, to add more content to it. These thick ideology provide a more detailed set of answers to key political questions. And the link with nationalism is the most diffuse and dangerous since it can imply, and here is a relation to the theme of the Congress and to Margaret's opening speech, it fosters violent conflicts, discrimination, and also non-democratic drift. The link with nationalism reinforces and organizes the populist ideology around the key questions of inclusion into exclusion from the community and on the reaffirmation of national sovereignty against the EU superstate. There is the widespread uh, it, pop, national populism fosters the belief that some immigrant groups as a whole, not single individual, are culturally incompatible with native community are threatening national identities, are competing for jobs and welfare provisions with indigenous and mostly the most vulnerable social groups to globalization, which explains, by the way, why these kind of party and movements make significant inroads on electorate, which was in the past a leftist electorate. And uh, more and foremost, is against, as I said, the superstate because it blames the EU institution for fostering the threat uh, by upholding the free movement of people. They are against the free movement of people. They want to renationalize policies. They want to restore national borders and they want to end the free movement of people. I have not the time to enter into a, a similar definition of nationalism, it is well known. Just say it is a very powerful ideology as we know. It was capable at different crucial moments in history to defeat other powerful ideologies like international socialism, First World War, or uh, 
ecumenical religious movement or economic world economic liberalism so just say that but again uh, populism and nationalism has uh, a lot in common uh, they can get along well in a sense not all populist movements and parties and leaders are nationalist not all nationalists are populist necessarily most of them are but certainly they can got, get along well and the uh, the question is why uh, national populism is again on the rise in a region of the world where the horror, tragedy, shame of two world wars had in a sense vaccinating, vaccinated European peoples against this risk. Mm -hmm. So we have to try to find explanation for that. There are, of course, uh, several different causal factors, if you want also opportunity structures for political entrepreneurs to exploit this kind of feeling sentiments and factors in order to gain consensus, to organize consensus. And, uh, but first of all, let's consider specifically those European countries which have been recent members of the EU and which are in the eastern part of Europe. There it's quite clear that uh, national populism has a strong cause, set of causes in the end of the long Cold War. The implosion of the Soviet Union has awakened cleavages and conflicts that during the war had been absorbed into the bipolar confrontation between the USA and USSR. And the end of the struggle between two alternative Weltanschauungen helped explain the resurgence of national, ethnic, religious identity and related geopolitical conflicts that had been anesthetized and hidden behind the rhetoric of the competing universalistic ideologies of free society communism. But these old cleavages inherited from the past intersect and partly overlap with the new conflicts stemming from the uh, paradigm change, the basic regime change in those countries. Because when, uh, with the collapse of the ancien regime, when planned economy, social security system break down, traditional social relations are in flux, there is a sentiment of general insecurity and ethnic groups are brought to rely on their cultural and linguistic communities. I think it was Hobsbawm who wrote some time ago, a long time ago, where society fails, the nation seems the only guarantee and national populism prospers. Prosper. But of course, we know that uh, there are not only national parties, movements and leaders of Eastern Europe are not the only instance of resurgent contemporary national populism. And here we have to put to the fore another set of explanation which is related to globalization. By the way, each of us has made reference to his own presidential address. I think in 2002 in Brisbane, my presidential address, presidential address was on uh, the contradiction on globalization and alternative models and key actors of global governance. And globalization is relevant also in this short speech of today. In the sense that, as we know, uh, global processes have uh, fostered a crisis of uh, democracy, which is both a crisis, of a crisis of legitimacy, a crisis of representative democracy, and a crisis of effectiveness, which is a crisis of performing democracy. Because traditional parties have uh, make, find more and more difficult to give a political representation to all those who are, or perceived to be, losers in the globalization process, who feel the deterioritorialization deterioritor <laughs> and uprooting caused by globalization, 
and uh, which uh, demand a kind of uh, policy which is uh, often at odds with uh, the long financial crisis and also with the exit strategies which were successful in the European Union to overcome the crisis, but which left serious, very serious consequences in terms of rising inequality, uh, increase of unemployment and underemployment. At the same, so this makes, I mean, a crisis of representation, but there is a kind also of performing democracy. Because as we know, uh, global processes have uh, eroded national sovereignty and uh, in this sense uh, make more difficult for national leaders, national governments to perform uh, policies which can cope with the problems raised by global process and uh, make it more and more difficult to deliver what they promise. National populist parties are particularly uh, generous in uh, promising uh, things that it cannot be delivered, but certainly there is something in that, and it is the fact that the erosion of national sovereignty creates a problem. Welfare state systems are also uh, shrinked or remodeled, and uh, the traditional intermediary role of parties, unions, business organization uh, has been also undermined. On the other hand, in the European Union, the erosion of national sovereignty of member states could be compensated by supranational governments, but this has happened only to a limited extent because the union is still unaccomplished and suffers from a democratic deficit. I come to the last set of causes very briefly. Uh, the rise of national populism can be traced, last but not least, also to the cultural dimension of globalization, namely to the explosion of digital communication, which has amplified the role of media, new, old and new, in the political space. We all know that traditional media, commercial television in particular, have exerted since long ago significant influence in politics. Communication specialists have replaced party cadre and fostered the personalization of leadership. The marketization of mass media dictates its own logic to which political actors have to adapt. Televised talk shows treat politics as any other messages, fulfilling the need of drawing viewer attention by turning everything into something spectacular, oversimplifying, overdramatizing every issue, stereotyping, demonizing rivals, reiterating scandals and personal accusations. The new digital media turned out to be even more influential in this respect. Mm. They have further weakened political parties' capability to mediate and intermediate and have undermined the authority of scientists, experts, intellectuals. Authority based on knowledge and experience is challenged daily by millions of web users who pretend to be experts of everything and are perennially indignant. The refusal to listen to the opinion of an expert and to verify the reliability of a presumed scandal is part and parcel with the populist distrust and hostility toward any type of elite, including the intellectual elite, with the concept that many people are victims of false news, covert manipulation, conspiracy, conspiracy theories, post-truth. Of course, digital, the digital revolution has also creates, uh, has great opportunities for democracy, for bettering the quality of democracy. But blogs and social networks, at least most of them, are seldom used in order to better the knowledge of reality, develop the critical mind, experiment with forms of deliberative democracy, educate citizens to respect different opinions and be open to dialogue, debate and even compromise. The internet, on the contrary, is more often used for naming and shaming, making up scapegoats, expressing frustration and prejudice, complaining while putting the blame always on others, 
for misdoing and failures in a game of collective lack of responsibility. So the field is open for the diffusion of messages that foster national populism. And it is true that also, and I finish on that, national populism can provide an answer to at least one side of this crisis of representative democracy because they provide strong identity, sense of belonging. They prove to be able to express certain passions, uh, interests, uh, views, or their voters. But certainly, they cannot provide an answer to the crisis of performative democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are a kind, provide a kind of distorted relationship. Because in uh, the program of uh, populist parties and leaders, when they are in the opposition, there are usually promises which are absolutely impossible to uh, fulfill. When they get to power, however, they can hold power for long because they always put the blame on others. They say, look, I tried, but other powerful forces, usually, again, corrupted elites, prevented us from doing that. So what's the alternative? One minute left. In this part of the world, at least, in this corner of the world, I'm not now, but I usually am, the European Union, in my view, is just to go on, develop the project of a supranational democratic union. I'm very afraid that UK just step out. <laughs> We're stepping out. But in order to do that, it's not only, and this can be done on, through reinforced cooperation and uh, variable geometry, whatever you want, those who agree, those member states and peoples who agree must go on. The other will follow. But this must be done by trying to cope with the real problems that the European Union has and that sometimes are exposed rightly by these national populist movements and parties. But we haven't to follow national populist parties, try to go behind them in order to get the votes from them. We must present a quite different alternative project which must have as major component an idea of a social Europe, not only a market European Union, but a social European Union. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, our, our next speaker is Piotr Stromka, and uh, he will, his, the title of his talk is The Moral Capital, Much Needed uh, Resource. I propose to turn our attention to a bit different level, to a level of uh, imponderables and intangibles, to the quality of social fabric in our time, and particularly the quality of what I call the moral capital or the condition of the moral space. Because I believe in this direction we may find one possible explanatory lead to the main question of this Congress, as put by Margaret, namely, why is there so much violence, conflict, inequality, injustice in the world today? Approaching it from a completely different perspective may give some enlightenment, I hope. And in fact, all full message of my talk could be grasped in the words by a British philosopher, John Gray. And I quote, no free society shall survive long without solid moral traditions and social conventions. The alternative to such standards is not individualism and autonomy, but coercion and social pathologies. I could probably finish with that, mm -hmm. but my obligation is to fill 15 minutes. So in those 15 minutes, I will first introduce my understanding of the concept of moral space and moral uh, capital, then dissect it into six dimensions, and third, argue why it is disastrous if moral capital is decaying or missing. Now, 
In the studies of social development, modernization, or more general, in the studies of the transformation of societies, the most common emphasis is on the hard, tangible factors at the macro level, which refers to the whole society. The emphasis is on economic resources and viable organizational forms, for example, efficient legal order or administrative frameworks. And at the micro level, which pertains to individual members of society, the emphasis is on the level of education and skills, often labeled as human capital. Another crucial resource is often neglected, the moral values, culturally embedded and individually internalized rules indicating the proper quality of interpersonal relations. I believe, in fact, in a kind of Zimmerian tradition, that society is not something of a systemic sort hanging above our heads. Society is also not just a bunch of individuals. Society is in between. Society is in the relations between and among people. And therefore, regulation of such relations is crucial for the well-being of both individual persons and of the whole societies. Such moral values constitute moral capital. Now, let me disentangle the notion of moral capital in my understanding. Why moral and why capital? Moral values, for me, are those which regulate most important forms in which people relate to each other, to other people, safeguarding their collective and individual well-being. They define the duties of societal members. Duty, it means normative meaning, applies to three aspects of interhuman relations, acting, thinking, and feeling. First of all, the rules associate duty with the behavioral level. They regulate what we should do. They also regulate another level. They associate with the mental level, aspirations, desires, ambitions. Moral rules regulate what we should want. And finally, they also regulate something even more intangible, namely emotional expression, in which we are involved, uh, were involved in the relations to other people. They regulate the nature of intensity of allowed, permitted, preferred emotions, which are to be found in social life, in order to avoid, for example, what Hobbes called the war of all against all. What are the most important moral values? I have my own list. It may not be exhaustive, but for me there are six. Six moral, core moral values governing crucial interhuman relationships. Trust, loyalty, reciprocity, solidarity, respect, and justice. Those produce a syndrome, a syndrome of sane, healthy, moral space. They prescribe what is preferred, what should be done, what should not be done, and they produce a syndrome because they are interconnected. Each is somehow dependent on the other. And among the six, my personal taste tells me that the crucial one is trust. Trust is involved in all other five. Let me argue for that in a moment. What is trust? Well, trust is the resp human response to the condition of uncertainty in which we live concerning the responses of other people to us. We can't live without others. We have to act toward and with others or side by side with others, but we never can be sure how others will react. And that produces a risk in every action we take, and that produces a need for trust as a bridge over the sea of uncertainty which we encounter. I have my favorite definition of trust, which says that it is a bet on the contingent future actions of other people. It is like in a casino, we just bet. We may be wrong, but it is always good to try our luck. And that is the main substance of trust. Now, there are other moral values, loyalty. 
Loyalty is a duty to reciprocate trust in a sense, not to behave badly toward those who trust us, to be trustworthy if we are given trust by others. So loyalty prevents us from doing something wrong toward those who have been trusting us. Of course, uh, all those, um, already even those two main values have their opposites. Instead of trust, we may have pervasive suspiciousness of other people, which prevents us from any creative action, prevents us from opening to others, and produces a lot of problems, both personal and social. The same is true of loyalty. The opposite of loyalty is opportunistic obedience imposed by force or the threat of force, threat of repression. The concept of loyalty does not apply to phoners, to obsequious yes men who obey their boss without reservations because they do not wish to be thrown out of the party or sect, which gives them numerous benefits. And if one belongs to the mafia, which is very similar in many respects to those other institutions I just mentioned in one breath. One does not want to end up in a lake with brick attached to your legs. Such opportunism becomes uncomfortable. So yes, men quickly rationalize their conduct, begin to really believe in the infallibility and genius of their leader. The American psychologist Irving Jennings called this phenomenon groupthink. It consists in people losing and dissolving their personalities in a closed group whose members mutually strengthen their beliefs and gradually move farther and farther from reality, but also from other groups in a society. Some of you who are more interested in politics will recognize the echoes of the experience I personally have in my country in Poland. The third moral value is reciprocity. Reciprocity from Malinowski through uh, Marcel Mauss, through Alvin Guldner, it means sim very simply that um, uh, if you are given something good, you are obliged. It produces an obligation, a gift of sorts, produces an obligation on your part to reciprocate. And the pathology of that is um, bribe benefit with instrumental intention to obtain something specific. It contributes to corrupt community only outwardly based on mutual trust, but in fact on very ugly kind of trust. Also loyalty is only superficial here because it's based on mutual blackmail when both parties can blackmail each other. The fourth moral value in my catalog is solidarity. Solidarity meaning simply the readiness to think about common good, to sacrifice one's own interests for a larger or smaller community, for the family, for neighbors, for professional groups, ethnic, religious, national, continental, perhaps all human in the concept of human rights, in the hope that such a community will show concern for our problems and will reciprocate with compassion, help and care when we are in need. When authentic solidarity is lacking, a pathological, xenophobic and intolerant form of solidarity emerges, which was described quite long ago by the British social and anthropologist Edward Benfield as amoral feminism, which denotes a solidarity within a limited group, a formerly a tribe, then professional circle, trade union, political party, religious sect, or mafia organization. The strength of such solidarity relies on blind internal loyalty and absolute obedience to the leader, while being separated from society at large by a tight wall of reluctance and aggression. Such solidarity does not unite, but separate, divides, does not integrate, but excludes, creates an inseparable dichotomy of us and them reserving the virtues only for us and attributing the sins to stranger or even denying them human dignity. This is not a solidarity of cooperation, but a solidarity of a besieged fortress. A common ethical space exists only within and outside is a desert or 
a hostile world which should be eliminated or limited. The value number five is respect. Respect is uh, simply the possibility to, to believe that other people recognize our services, what we do, achievements, successes, it will be uh, noticed uh, proportionally to the input that we give and also proportionally to our efforts, talents, contribution. Now, as all rules, respect may also be abused or misdirected. Notorious case of misdirected respect of the highest form, namely of fame, is the category of so-called celebrities. Their elevated status is usually the product of media marketing rather than achievements. Finally, a huge, huge topic of justice, by which I simplify in my mind simply to believe that it means fair balance of proper proportion between what we give to others and what we expect, what others owe us. Such proportion should be universally respected. The most important meta rule referring to all forms of justice, and I have no time to, uh, to list all those forms, is that it should be applied without regards of any particularistic criteria in equal universalistic way to all, irrespective of the status, role, etc. In fact, all applications of justice produce eventually or enhances some inequality unequal wages, unequal rewards, unequal penalties, unequal measures of verbal or symbolic respect. So I have my, well, a bit paradoxical definition of justice that it is the equal application of the equal principles of inequality. Equal application of the equal principles of inequality, producing inequality, but based on merit, on, on effort, on talent, or other things, which should be proportional. Very simply, Aristotle, before me, already <laughs> defined it this way. Thus, to summarize, the moral space decays if others fail our trust, act disloyalty, take advantage of us to promote selfish interests, refuse to respect us, ignore the achievements of others, and unfairly distribute available goods, honors, and privileges egoistically turning their backs on their community. Now, the second component of the concept is capital. Why moral capital? Well, capital means a resource which is fungible, maybe exchanged for other resources, and also which multiplies if applied. It multiplies in time when applied. Why is it so important to possess moral capital? This uh, is because, very simply, we need other people. We need them for many reasons. Uh, capital of this sort provides existential security, feeling of rootedness, but also it satisfied our three main moral needs, not moral needs, but uh, human needs, very simply. It satisfied, first of all, mm, uh, the need to talk, and we have to have others we trust to talk to, as we know perfectly well in this Congress, in the lobby and other places. Uh, we have another need for audience, which happens at this moment. I wouldn't be able to provide any information or talk to you if the, there was nobody in the audience. So we need to have a need for audience, and there is a need for mirror, as Goffman and others have already shown us we need others to know who we are ourselves. So for all those reasons, we need uh, moral capital and it is useful. It may be useful also for instrumental reasons. We may find advice, help, support from others who are within us, who, who are together with us within the same moral space and which observe the same kind of principles. The same, in the same way, the groups themselves, the communities themselves pervaded with moral capital, not only function effectively, but provide more happiness and um, good life to their members. They provide cooperation, facilitate efficiency, because they pull together the efforts, the, the 
pools of knowledge, etc. It levels transaction costs. So, to con coming to the end of my 15 minutes and the conclusion, without a place in the interhuman space and without recognized values, the fate of a person, as Thomas Hobbes already wrote, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, entangled in the war of alls, all against all. The benefits for communi community are vitality, efficiency, developmental dynamics. This is due to several circumstances. First, to integration of community. Metaphorically speaking, moral values constitute the cement of society or the glue that keeps society together the terms by Jon Elster. Second, moral values encourage cooperation. They mesh together the gears of the social machine, the term by Senate. Third, they support coordination of various activities, enable harmonious relations. They serve as social lubricant, the term by a Polish scholar, Maria Osowska. Moral capital is the important resource in shaping the robust agency, able to push society forward to produce creative self-transformation, progressive social development. Alas, the realities of many societies are witnessing the opposite syndrome. The levels of distrust, both horizontal toward other people and vertical toward institutions, are alarmingly high. The citizens' loyalty toward the state of public institutions is very low. In place of reciprocity, there is widespread exploitation. The idea of a common good is treated as an abstraction, replaced by rampant egoism. Abuse, hostility, and violence replace respect. Injustice of all sorts prevail. It is a big mistake to treat these intangibles and imponderables as soft, irrelevant factors, putting all emphasis on hard, political, material, economic, financial meanings of capital. Distrust, suspiciousness, egoism, interestedness, contempt, hostility, and injustice are the sure receipt for social disaster. History shows persuasively that the decay of the moral space is preceding the collapse even of the strongest empires. Without moral capital, social development is not to be achieved. And two question marks which I put for your consideration, which for me are also question marks at the end of this presentation. The first question, to what extent we are dealing here with the explanatory factor, or to what extent the decay of moral capital is the result of violence, of inequality, of uh, all those which we discuss so widely in this Congress? Is, or perhaps, excusez le mot, it is a dialectic here. Both are somehow interconnected and mutually influence each other. But in my understanding, moral space and moral capital is very crucial ingredient. But what is the level of causality? Hard to say. Yesterday, I remember uh, somebody talking at the commemorative session to Nils Melzer that there is never any possibility for one causal, single causal explanations. So I'm not claiming that that's the only factor, but it's a very crucial factor. And the second very difficult question is what can be done? Mm -hmm. A classical question, what should be done? And here I only have a hint. A hint is that the moral decay cannot be overcome from above, cannot be overcome by moralizing, like I have been involved in a way in my talk. It cannot also be produced by political elites mm. from above. The only hope, as far as I am concerned, is from the grassroots mobilization of the people, social movements, the common exchange of views, and mobilizing through voluntary organizations, through associations, through all sorts of discussion clubs, debates, in this way, the habits of moral action are growing and they may also grow to the level of higher, more complex social reality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, our last speaker.
for today is Michel Viviorca, uh, and the title of his talk is Preventing and Exiting Violence, a Domain for Sociology. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I am very happy to be here, and I want to tell you, you are in front of you a very unique club with a very limited number of members, a new member Dying each four years. years, so Margaret, be ready in a few hours. You will become a full member of our club, <laughs> and a meeting every four years, that's all. So it's rather unique, I believe. So as we can see, including in our program, uh, this time, violence is a very important issue. And it's an issue that I would like to deal with some optimism if you follow the proposal that will conclude my small uh, presentation. Violence, as such, is an issue of particular significance for the humanities and social science. Most researchers and schools of thought have, at some point, explored or dealt with it. It has been the central theme of countless theories, as well as so many empirical studies in sociology, and more broadly speaking, for the humanities and social sciences. Defining violence is not so easy. A pure universalist objective approach will, for example, propose a quantification, the number of crimes in a country, persons killed in a war, suicides, and so on. But violence is also subjective. The definition depends on what a person, a group, or a society considers as such at any given point in time. Now, other people, other groups, other societies may have different perceptions, which make it difficult to generalize and encourages tendencies to relativism. This difficulty is particularly obvious with terrorism, as we already know, because it's a very frequent sentence, the terrorist for some is a freedom fighter for others. Suffice it to say that the humanities and social sciences have by no means exhausted the attempts to conceptualize violence and go further than the non-scientific definitions that you can find in daily life or in the media. This type of endeavor demands discussion and we shall engage therein. An issue is really a sociological issue, and this will be my first point, when it is subject to debates. I would like to say that violence is an issue for us because there are debates, and I would like to give two or three very concrete examples. In the early 80s, at a time when the Red Brigades and other armed struggle organizations were operational in Italy, I had the opportunity of attending a meeting in Florence. The historian Charles Tilly, who was a leading exponent of the so-called mobilization of resources school of thought, discussed his approach to terrorism as opposed to that of Ted Robert Gurr. Gurr was and is a leading exponent of the current in American political sociology, which considers that the participation of the actors in this type of violence is explained by their relative frustration. I don't want to enter in the debate, but it was very interesting to see that with very polite attitude, you could have a debate between two different schools of thoughts. A second example that I would like to give was eight years ago at the Congress of the ISA in Göteborg, I had a fascinating discussion about the analysis of violence with Randall Collins. And we continued this discussion after in an Italian sociological review. He defended an interactionist approach in a book which has become a classic, whereas I was advocating research based on the subjectivity of these actors, that is to say, some things that exist well before the point of the intersubjective encounter in which the violence may break out. So two different ways of analyzing violence, and it was a very fruitful debate for him and for me, I believe, and we still continue to discuss. I was discussing with him one month ago in Paris. I would like to take a last example in a more recent one. 
in France in 2016, we had a very, very interesting discussion about jihadism. And, uh, and this discussion was not only a French discussion, but it started from Paris. The idea was to understand something. Is primarily Islam or, or Islamism religion, which is the source of the phenomenon of jihadism, of violent jihadism, or do we have to consider that social radicalization comes before religion? That is to say, do people become terrorists, to say it very shortly, do, become, do people become terrorists because of religion, first of all, or because of radical sources, discrimination, social exclusion, and, and so on? It was a great debate. Gilles Kepel was on one side explaining that we have to focus on radicalization coming after Islam, and Olivier Roy was explaining that it's exactly the country. And the solution of this debate was given very recently by somebody who was here yesterday or the day before, Farad Kosro Kava, maybe you were with him, uh, Margaret, who explains that it depends, it depends concretely, you have some people that have been uh, raised within a religious uh, world, but you have also some theories that discovered Islam at the very last moment. So it's very important to see that sociology or social science improve through debate. Sometimes debate is not possible, or sometimes the academic debate is transformed into a, a very violent conflict. I will just give one other French example. In France, we have two kinds of researchers working on the genocide in Rwanda. I can tell you the two groups are in such an opposition that each is uh, um, attacking the other one, saying that they are uh, negationists, that they, that they are supporting some forms of genocide. And it becomes a war, a terrible war. So here, you don't have debate. You have violence between two, kind of, two, two groups of researchers, including in the media. So I insisted on this to say violence is a domain for social science and for sociology because we can have debates within uh, uh, this field. Now, I would like to quote two um, colleagues that I don't know, but maybe some of you know them, because they wrote a very interesting piece. They are called John Gledhill and Jonathan Bright, Oxford Internet Institute. I don't know anything more. And in a paper, they say something like, more, spec, more space is devoted, generally speaking, to the study of violence than to the study of peace. There is, they say, little academic exchange between those who study war and those who study peace. And they also report the existence of many divisions uh, among uh, researchers working on, on these issues. And this finding, this finding, because it was a, a really a, the fruit of uh, some research, was absolutely in keeping with my own observations. I consider, because I've seen that, that there is a huge difference between research on violence, I will not say war, but war violence, because it is well-developed, varied, varied, and with many debates, and research focused on exiting or preventing violence, which is much less studies. Closer considerations reveal a fragmented space, as far as preventing and exiting violence are at stake, in which technical, activist, militant, institutional, technical skills are mobilized. For instance, you will have medical doctors that will explain traumatism associated with the experience of terrorism. You will have a lot of lawyers dealing with transitional justice, international consultants dealing with peacekeeping, conflict resolution, nation building, and so on. But this is not sociological research as such. And so if we have to start, as Gladhill and Bright do, with this image of a separation between the two registers, violence and preventing and exiting violence, we observe that the second register, unlike the first, is in no way reminiscent of a structured domain of research in sociology. 
And we must maybe also admit that exiting of preventing violence is not simply the reverse or the contrary of violence. It is not a symmetrical issue. It is not because you can understand, analyze some episode of violence that you can uh, erase it or finish with it by dealing with their causes. To say differently, there are these specificities that are inherent to the prevention or to the exit from violence, and this demands consideration. So how can we articulate the two sets of issues, violence and preventing and exiting violence? This is a real issue. Is it possible to transform this field of exiting and prevention which is a very concrete, practical, professional field into a sociological field, and which relationship can we create between the two domains? This is, for me, a very interesting uh, point. Let me say a few words about zoos that produce knowledge on preventing and exiting violence. You have countless actors that intervene in this field. And they go from, at an extreme, the question of avoiding, minimizing, or ending violence that affects individuals until very general global issues. Let me be a little bit more precise to give you an image of how huge should be this area. What can be done for the American Vietnam War vets who witnessed or possibly participated in killings sometimes in barbaric ways, and cannot recover? What about child soldiers enlisted at a very young age in a guerrilla movement in Africa, which has now surrendered? And at the other extreme, what do we do with global terrorism, organized criminality, international drug trafficking, uh, world regions of the planet devastated by war, as it is the case today in the Middle East? So we have to deal with very individual issues and with very general or global issues, we have two, and between the two extremes, there is no shortage of problems at the level of towns, village, local area, for instance, at the level of nation states, or at the many other levels. It is true that many skills are mobilized in order to prevent or to exit from violence. And I, I gave some examples, I could give many others, Doctors, medical doctors, but also psychiatrists, psychologists, lawyers, but also diplomats, consultants, militants, NGOs. NGOs are very important people because they know a lot about preventing and exiting violence. But also soldiers, politicians, etc. All these people can draw lessons from their experience and think about their actions and then produce knowledge Sometimes these people have a, back, a sociological background. They have been trained by Michael Burevoy or uh, some of us here. It's true. But these people are not social scientists. They are able to produce knowledge, but they are not able to produce it as we sociologists can do it. And so this gives a general domain which is loosely structured dominated by empirical knowledge with no recourse to theorizing. And I agree with Michael, it's very important to theorize. So it is not because these issues are, are not very important or of little interest to citizens, to political actors, to public policies makers, etc. On the contrary, but maybe it has something to do <coughs> with the fact that during many, many years, our traditional conception of violence have long rendered the project of constituting a domain in sociology or a field in sociological research devoted to violence was unnecessary because violence was not what we consider to do today as, uh, as violence. So let me, because time is coming, let me give you the three possibilities that, that we have, and I finish with this, if we want to consider that preventing and exiting violence are as important issues as violence. First solution, let us extend the analysis of violence 
to the one that deals with preventing and exiting violence. That is to say, let us try to see if the more we know on processes through which violence appears and develops, the more we should be able to know on how to cope with it, putting an net exiting. But this cannot define a new domain. This is just connected with violence. The second solution consists in taking seriously all this knowledge produced by all these actors that participate in processes of, exi of exiting or preventing violence. And then ask them and maybe help them to transform this knowledge into sociological knowledge and analysis, and not only practical observations and empirical knowledge. This can be done with the intervention of social scientists. But this does not help us really to constitute this issue as a, in a, as a domain for us. So there is a last possibility, which is a last solution, which consists in deciding to work on these actors, institutions, organization, political powers, etc., that intervene in this huge field, considering that they are what is to be studied, considering all these people and groups that I have been quoting, diplomats, medical doctors, uh, consultants, politicians, considering them as what we should study. So this is uh, what I personally would love to promote, uh, this third solution, which means that sociology must also work on those actors that deal with important issues and not only on actors that are part of important issues. Thank you for this moment. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Michel. We, uh, we had uh, we have just two, two minutes, and I know we said we'd promised you for questions, and I don't know whether we'd have a chance to do that. But uh, I do want to, I will take a, a couple of questions, but let me just quickly say that in the, the, the aim of this particular session was to also have all the presidents, uh, past presidents, uh, reflect upon some of the issues, and each one of them is a strand, whether it was a regulation or commodification or what we thought of as in terms of democracy, moral capital, uh, exiting and prevention. Uh, and while I can debate uh, with some of those perspectives, uh, I'm going to leave it uh, to after the, the session. So uh, we can take two questions, and <coughs> I think that's going to be it. Yeah. Um, this is for Michael. Uh, Michael, if I understood you correctly, uh, a major theoretical move was the contention that market fundamentalism is not just present at the origins of capitalism, but as a recurrent development within capitalism. The capitalism changes. So for example, a movement from an international economy grounded in exchange to one in production, and therefore a definition of the value of labor power movement from it defined nationally to internationally or development of finance capital. So the question that I have is, how has market fundamentalism changed? What do we have to know? How do we have to theorize the nature of market fundamentalism beyond what Pugliani has done? And how does that theorization affect how we confront it effectively? We're going to take the questions uh, at one go and then do it. Otherwise, it gets. Uh, yeah. Let me make a quick remark addressed to Michael and to Michel. I agree with what you've said, but uh, I agree especially uh, with the importance of theory being uh, a sort of, of a crucial dimension of our reflections and also I, rec I listened to Michel, why is there such a surplus of attention given to violence in research and not to nonviolence? My suggestion is to bring back 
to the consciousness of graduate students and the consciousness of practicing sociologists, the significance of Sorokin. Piturim Sorokin, one of my great teachers, not the only one, but one of my great teachers, because Sorokin knew violence. He had experienced violence through the revolutions. He was almost sent to execution and was at the last minute he was saved from that. He, so he had a direct experience of violence. He saw people. He wrote about the famine, how people lived in violent terms in famine, which I don't think most people here know what famine is. But in famine, the, the normative conducts of everyday life disappear. I'm just suggesting that this is an occasion to bring back Sorokin out of the stillbirth of sociology and to make him a live, a live, a live figure. Thank and you. I think this would help a lot. Thank you. Yeah. And please keep uh, the questions really short, otherwise we're already, you know, Okay, oh, yeah, sorry. very quick question. Um, Aylin Topar from Turkey. I'm sure you all know about what's happened in Turkey, but um, um, just a few, a few weeks ago, uh, a, a, a um, convicted uh, ultra-nationalist uh, gang who had said, we are going to shed blood in the streams and take bath in your blood, uh, saying to these peace uh, petitioners, and uh, we will be waiting, them, waiting for them in the streets, uh, he said. And uh, he was acquitted. He was let free in the, in the um, uh, court, uh, saying that it was a freedom of thought and expression. So this is a, a mind-boggling question to many of us. How did peace, asking for peace, became a violent, uh, to be punished uh, act, signing a petition? And how did such a, a violent hate crime uh, has become a, something that uh, goes away without any um, punishment. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we'll start with that. Is it? Uh, I think we'll, are there any more questions? Okay. Shall we go ahead with the, okay, shall we start? All right. Well, okay. <laughs> I'll just respond very briefly to, to Mark's question. Um, yeah, I think it's very important for us to theorize the meaning of market fundamentalism. I think we have to, I be, think that capitalism has gone through different phases of market fundamentalism and have to be dis, they have to be distinguished from one another. And if I were to do that, I would deploy Polanyi's fictitious commodities and see the relationships between the commodification of each of those fictitious commodities and see which of those fictitious commodities prevail in these different periods of market fundamentalism and to see in the present period the importance of the commodification of knowledge and how that is being promoted by the commodification of money, labor, and nature. Well, uh, it's difficult to answer to the last point, but what I want to say is that what happens in Turkey today is a real big issue for us sociologists, on the one hand because it's a real problem, and on the other hand because we have to support our colleagues and students, uh, and, and uh, I know many people, including in this room, that are doing their best, but it's a real big issue. Now I would like to, to answer to our colleague Tiviakian about why today we can study, or we want to study, or some people want to study, not only violence, but exiting, and. Uh, preventing violence. My answer will be historical. Until the 70s, maybe the early 80s, violence could be supported by many people, including social scientists. You had Marxists, you had people that love revolution, guerrilla, you had the idea that sometimes violence is necessary, you had the idea of a, a role in history, Engels, and you had many reasons sometimes ideological, sometimes very serious, decolonization, maybe it was impossible without, without violence. So violence was something which has some legitimacy. 
And I think that during the last 30 years, more or less, 25 years, violence has lost most of its legitimacy. Not, not, maybe not all of it, but most of it. It became a kind of taboo. And it is because almost nobody among social scientists, intellectuals, almost nobody has been defending or promoting the idea of violence that it became possible to say, okay, now let us try and see how to put an end to violence. So my idea would be to have a, an historical and political uh, explanation of the, on this point. I have no time to, to be more precise, but just remember what Sartre, for instance, could write in the 60s in the pre famous preface to The Damned of the Earth uh, by Franz Fanon, asking for violence. Remember Michel Foucault, it was not so clear and I simplified. Remember Michel Foucault visiting Khomeini in Iran during the revolution. Who is going to visit today Daesh, uh, ISIS uh, uh, in, in Af Sub-Saharan Africa or whatever? This time is are finished. Maybe they could come back. We have some indications that in some places violence is recovering some legitimacy. But this would be my point, connecting the study as a definition of a field and the historical changes and context. Just a very short comment on um, the last question. Um, I didn't uh, refer to Turkey because I was uh, referring only to the European Union member states, but certainly in Turkey nowadays, uh, Turkey is an example of uh, national populism in power and um, of the risk of this kind of uh, government party in terms of uh, anti-democratic drift, in terms of violence by the state, because we are talking here about violence by movements, opponents, but the violence of the state is also a very important subject for sociologists, of course. So I think uh, I share with Michel the fact that we should do all what we can to help our own colleagues, journalists, all the people who are jailed just because they have different opinions in that country. Thank you. Um, it's always a good idea to listen for the absences as well as the presences. And one of the surprises to me was that no references made by any of us, despite our um, very strong tendency to agree on many things, but no reference to the largest of the NGOs and the role that the UN and its various agencies have played in and everything from anti-trafficking to, and this is something sociologically we should look at very seriously, the designation in 2015 of the new sustainable development goals for the period up to 2030. Now, these are extraordinarily interesting because I think what one could do, I don't know whether you've ever done it, Piot, was to take your six, your list of six main moral values and to see which of the SDGs actually advanced them. And I, I think there was this very heavy overlap, a good overlap an overlap for good. And so the last thing I, I want to say, which is not exactly in relation to the, the questions, was, and I would be a lot happier if we could stay with Aristotle and talk about moral virtues than talking about moral capital. <laughs> uh, I think, um, you know, all those who want to keep um, Bourdieu's uh, image alive are uh, extending this metaphor and it is nothing but a metaphor there's nothing you can do with morality that you can do with capital uh, y you can just introduce more metaphors that you can spend it or you can be morally bankrupt but these are just metaphorical they don't uh, actually I mean they're better in the hands of poets than they are in the hands of social theorists um, <laughs> So finally, uh, because uh, religion has rather a dirty 
name in relation to um, provocation of terrorism, jihadism, and so on. Um, let's also recognize that, oh, there are religions and religions and periods and periods uh, in which we'll characterize them differently, but the way we've been characterizing them today, yeah, I'm shutting up. Um, <laughs> uh, the way we've characterized it, them today is actually remarkably close to contemporary uh, Catholic social theory under Pope Francis, who has been the best leader for uh, anti-trafficking of humans, who's Laudato Si um, encyclical, um, was the best-selling book on um, climate change going, probably made more impact than we did. Um, so, you know, let's not, not homogenize all religions for all times. Just a word. Um, uh, exactly 50 years ago, Ralph Dallendorf wrote an essay on Homo sociologicus, and he emphasized, and I think quite rightly so, that human beings are rule governed. And uh, I find very interesting link with what uh, Margaret Archer was saying about this regulation stage of legal uh, legitimacy and my rather traditional belief in uh, moral fabric, which are simply different sides of the same coin of how people manage to create values, rules, norms, regulations which would be beneficial for them, rather than oppressive, rather than producing violence, conflicts, and injustices. So uh, one important point of another sort, which I draw from this session, is to repeat my belief that there is no one causal approach. We had many approaches here, and all of them add at least a bit to the enlightenment and to the understanding of the big issues which we face today in the world and which this Congress is facing. Thank you so much. Uh, as I am still current president, I will take the power for these 10 minutes, <laughs> uh, no, no, for a minute to just thank everybody, but I also want to be sure that we leave this session by kind of making a point here which was there was an underlying idea that we have moved away from theory and that we're only doing research or practice. Uh, and I think it's not an either or, it's, uh, it's both are happening, but there is a particular emphasis at a certain point that has to be uh, taken. And I, one of the things that I felt when we were hearing this, and of course we all have multiple perspectives, is the idea that theory has been kind of thrown out. I think it dep depends on how we sociologists are defining everyday theories and larger macro theories. So I think it's something for us to, to not say that we're not doing theory anymore. Uh, the other thing I do want to, to mention in reflecting about violence, uh, there is this idea that we've, and I know Michelle, you said it, that you know, we've not been thinking about violence in the same way. And I think a part of uh, the women's movement and uh, early uh, uh, anti-violence movement has been actually talking about violence for a long, long time that just somehow gets erased because we have these big names in the canon who we all know about. And so I want to end on this note that uh, there are large segments that we haven't also addressed. So yeah, thank okay. you so much. And this was really a, a wonderful session and you truly all shared your reflections and where we should go forward with. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well done.